Telemax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome to the show. Coming up today... For the Birds, a smartphone game that's a hit with millions worldwide. Recipe for success. One of Germany's top chefs doesn't believe that less is more. And it's a small world. Photographer Thomas Breeder's deceptive landscapes. But first, every written culture has its own version of calligraphy, which is literally the art of beautiful writing. However, it seems to be a dying art. One of those still keeping it alive is French artist Julien Breton, who goes by the name of Callum. His style is intriguing, especially when you see him in action at night. When Julien Breton waves his light wands late at night, it seems like nothing much is happening at first. But his movements are curiously precise. And later on a long exposure photograph, his artistry becomes apparent. Julien Breton creates calligraphy using light. When I discovered the technique of light painting, it truly was a revelation. Now I can use my entire body in my work. It's all about capturing the moment, about total concentration. You've only got one chance and you have to paint it very precisely. Breton is based in Nantes, in western France. He's entirely self-taught and has been a calligrapher for over 10 years, working mainly on paper. For the past three years, he's been able to make a living off his art. He draws inspiration from many different writing systems. The power and the spontaneity is what inspires me with Asian culture. Arabic calligraphy is very sensual and flowing, while the Latin alphabet is very stark. And I've also been influenced by the abstraction you see in graffiti. Breton discovered Arabic calligraphy when he was 21. He drew on its forms to create his own alphabet using the Latin script to which he gave an Arabic inflection. Developing that took him five years. It was a labor of love, and it wasn't just the visual and creative possibilities that drew him to the task. With the alphabet that I invented, which is French but looks Arabic, I'm also trying to demonstrate a common foundation, to create a spirit of community. With all the conflict between the West and Arab countries we see today, I wanted to do something to bring the two cultures together, to create a work of art that we could access together. Breton's calligraphy is also a choreography, and he practices each gesture until it's perfect. He draws on Eastern techniques to learn how to create using his entire body. Asian calligraphers spend two hours deep in concentration before they pick up their paintbrush, and then they paint in one single concentrated flowing movement. And that's exactly what I do with my light calligraphy. Breton works together with the photographer David Gallard, and he's starting to partner more and more with other artists, including DJs. Gala's technique involves focusing the camera and selecting an extremely long exposure time. That way, the camera captures only the strongest sources of light. The person who is guiding the light becomes an invisible shadow. It's different from the way other people do light graffiti, which is pretty abstract. To be honest, I think they don't convey much by way of content. It's just an aesthetic game. That's what's so special about Julien. He produces a finished work of art with a certain dexterity and precision and makes it available through light. Breton has garnered numerous awards for his work. This year he won an International Urban Arts Award in the category of light graffiti. 
For the past three years, he's also been working with modern projection and motion capture techniques. He's appeared at all of Europe's top light festivals. In his newest projects, he's been collaborating with dancers. He's especially happy that his work has drawn popular and critical acclaim in Arab countries. A Tunisian once told me, you've taken something from our culture and blended it with your own, and now you've given something back to us. That was the best compliment I could have asked for. Art has long been a way to transcend barriers of language and culture, and Julien Breton has done so using light. Computer gaming has become popular the world over, increasingly so on smartphones. And any gamer has heard of Angry Birds. It was developed by the Finnish entertainment media company Rovio, and it's in its first year that it was downloaded 50 million times. It was the surprise hit of 2010 on the app market, and Rovio has nearly tripled its staff to keep up with the demand. We travelled to the land of its birth, Finland, to keep, kill a few birds with one stone for the story. Colourful birds being catapulted at green pigs. In the smartphone game Angry Birds, pigs have stolen the birds' eggs and our feathered friends take their revenge. The aim is to destroy the pigs and their thoughts. In two years, the game has been downloaded an eye-popping 500 million times. And in the countdown to Christmas, there's a new Winter Wonderland-themed level every day. It all started here, at Finnish game developer Rovio. The company had already published 53 moderately successful games before releasing Angry Birds two years ago. My cousin, uh, Niklas, who is also working here, he, he, uh, he had shown the game to his mother, who was having a dinner party and then uh, uh, she had actually had to delay the, the dinner party because she was playing the game for, for so long and, and she doesn't play any games at all. And, and uh, the next day Nicholas came back and said, I think we, we're on to something. They had all the basic characters and looked for the game, but some crucial elements were still missing. At first we didn't have the slingshot at all and uh, people didn't understand what's going on in the game because there was the bird it was there and there was the castle but like they did, couldn't understand what's uh, what they should do and then when we added the slingshot then it, it was obvious because everybody knows how to use the slingshots Jako is working on new constructions for his birds to destroy each game only costs 79 cents to download but millions of fans add up to serious money for Rovio and the range of different editions, already including Christmas, Easter and Valentine's Day, is set to grow. A mobile game stage should start really fast and you should be able to play it like three minutes and then stop and then continue later on. So it's a different from like console games where you actually use, are sitting on the couch and, and play for three hours. But I've actually heard that people play this uh, on the couch a lot. And it's becoming a pretty common pastime on the street, too. It's part of the casual games genre, something people use as time fillers. It's different, something new. It's great for smartphones. It's rated well and I rate it highly, too. It's quite good if you're waiting for the train. It helps pass the time. One of the first worldwide smartphone game hits was Doodle Jump in 2009. A completely new market for games has emerged in its wake. Cut the Rope is one of the latest successes. In the first four months after its launch, it was downloaded 20 million times. Worldwide hype surrounding casual games is nothing new. Ten years ago, Crazy Chicken had millions of fans, most of them back then via a PC. Now there are smartphone versions too. And the recipe for worldwide success was the same then as it is now. Creating simple characters, having fun adventures. 
ist extrem einfach zu bedienen. It's extremely user friendly and easy to learn, but at the same time the goals are pretty difficult. Even if you figure out right away how it works, it gets tougher, and you really have to think hard about how to complete each level. Es wird immer immer schwerer und man muss sich wirklich Gedanken machen, was wie man diese Level löst. Angry Birds' success has seen Rovio's staff and operations flourish. The company is now valued at several hundred million euros. We want to, to build upon the, the characters and the universe that we have built and, uh, and uh, take it to further games, um, take it uh, to merchandising and, uh, and also uh, to some form of, of broadcast media. <laughs> In fact, Rovio is currently looking for a suitable director in Hollywood. The company is aiming high as it tries to take its Angry Birds and their global war on pigs to the big screen. I have a feeling that game might become my new way of passing the time on the train. Now. Ever wondered how the other half lives? Celebrities, those from the artistic world? Well, here in Berlin, an online blog gives an insight into just that, having become one of Germany's most popular in the realm of living and interior design. It's called freundevonfreundung.com, and it literally means friends of friends. Its online acceptance was such that the makers decided to also create a book version. These homes belong to designers, illustrators, and stylists. They have one thing in common. They all live in Berlin, and all of them were paid a visit by Frederik Frede and Tim Seifert. In 2009, the pair started the online project Freunde von Freunden, or Friends of Friends. The idea was that behind every interesting person is an interesting home. We always like to see how other people live. Many people look at our website and use it as inspiration for decorating their own apartments. It started with apartments belonging to the pair's circle of friends. But word gradually spread. Each month around 150,000 visitors to the site take a look at how Berlin's creative community lives. All that interest encouraged them to publish a book. Spanning more than 550 photos, it shows how illustrator Zara Illenberger, architect Axel van Exel, or fashion designer Vibke Dirks furnish their private spheres. There are 28 portraits in the book, a best of everything featured on the site. We picked our favorites, the ones that best represented Berlin, a cross-section of everything on the website. Another successful interiors blog was started by American photographer Todd Selby in 2008. The homes he captured included that of British it girl Peaches Geldof. The blog quickly spawned imitators like Zolebisch DE in Germany. Users can upload snapshots of their own living spaces. Professionals take the pictures for the Freunde von Freunden blog. Here the team visits gallery owner Sabina Schmidt in her apartment. The photos capture the rooms as they are. Every portrait includes an interview. Visitors to the blog should get an impression of the person who inhabits the spaces. That includes their creative environments like the gallery owner's exhibition room. Voyeurism plays a part, as does wanting to know how other people live. But the selection of people is very important too, including the stories they tell. One of the most spectacular apartments in the book belongs to the couple Karen and Christian Boros. They live in a converted bunker dating back to 1942. The building also houses a collection of more than 700 modern works of art. The couple's penthouse is on the roof. <laughs> Boros is also the book's publisher. The advertising executive also wants to introduce the book in France and the U.S. 
A friend had told him about the blog, and he immediately wanted to be a part of it. I never understood why people closed their windows and doors and hung blinds in the windows or whatever. I like to have contact to people I don't know. Boros bought the bunker in 2003. The remodeling of the building took five years. Karen and Christian Boros' apartment, that was a little dream from the beginning. We didn't know them, but knew we'd like to photograph it. Then the opportunity presented itself through various contacts. It's one of the nicest apartments in Berlin. It's full of pieces collected from all over the world, like this Chinese sculpture. It's a very personal collection. Ultimately, it's a bit like the work of a lifetime. Everything you see here. You can't simply copy it or buy it, but you can become inspired by a feeling of how it is to live in Berlin. The feeling of following your own rules. And Berliners aren't the only ones opening their doors to the web. The blog has started to present the homes of creative people from all over the world, and another book is already planned to showcase the best from cities around the globe. And I'm sure they'll blog about that one when it's been completed. Moving on now, though, to take a look at the delights of German chef Klaus-Peter Lump, who has recently been honoured with the Eckhart Witzigmann Prize, one of this country's most prestigious culinary awards. Lump runs the kitchen at his restaurant Bar Ice in southern Germany, and this prize shows that over the years he's continued to exceed himself, claiming his third Michelin star in 2007. <music> Klaus-Peter Lump at work in his restaurant Barreis. It's located in the town of Bayersbronn, tucked away in Germany's Black Forest. He's been cooking up a storm here for almost 20 years. The chef has held three Michelin stars since 2007. Look at me, I'm a man of indulgence. What I most like to eat is what I serve up to my guests. I try to convey to every guest that it should be a pleasure. Lump's cuisine is as hearty as the man himself. He was born in the southern German town of Tübingen in 1964 and learned how to cook from his grandmother. He later refined his skills at some of the top kitchens in Europe. Eckhard Witzigmann is a big role model for me and, of course, a long-time mentor. Back then, he told me the product is the star, and that's still my maxim. Everything we do is indebted to Alain Ducasse or Heinz Finkler. All of them brought me a step further. But over the years, you grow into the role and grow with the team. Today, there's relatively little influence from the old masters. The ingredients for his dishes are sourced locally. And Lump has a novel more is more approach to serving his meals. This liquid filled ravioli with quince will be served with venison. The main plate is saddle of venison with chestnut and rose hip sauce. When the main plates are out, then comes a smaller plate. It has a few mushrooms a la creme and a poached leg of venison. The deer doesn't just have a saddle, it also has a shoulder and a leg. Then there's another small dish with the shoulder and vegetables. Three, four, five morsels. Our a la carte dishes aren't just one plate. There's always a smaller menu complementing the main product. With so many plates and so many guests, extreme concentration is needed. 
That means we quickly have 12 different dishes for the four people at this table. Of course, that's a crazy atmosphere. Impressions, everyone looking, and it smells and tastes great. Lump wants his guests to unwind and enjoy. The restaurant is part of a five-star luxury hotel. The chef's newest project is a photo book. It's an up-close look at his day-to-day -day work. Just images, no recipes. It took shape in the kitchen, not in a studio. Everything was photographed here. Nothing was posed. We cooked and the photographer clicked away here. There was flash, too, so we really could get going. Then there was a white cloth placed here. So it was prepared, photographed, and sent straight to the guest. This year, Klaus-Peter Lump won the Eckhard Witzigmann Prize, named after his former mentor. Now he's followed his teacher into the league of Germany's top chefs. Up next, we take a look at some pictures that sometimes seem to be set in the desert or in those barren mountainous landscapes that you see in old cowboy movies. But photographer Thomas Vrida actually does all of his work here in Germany because not only is he a master of close-up photography, he's also great at manipulating perspectives. Our reporter caught up with him at work. Thomas Vreda's landscape photographs keep us puzzled. Is this really a playing field or is the photographer just playing with our senses? A dream hotel or a vision from a dream? A genuine quarry or just a toy model? Reality and fiction are blurred in Thomas Vreda's carefully composed real landscapes. It's one of my artistic concepts to assemble things by changing the perspective, or I create perspectives myself that don't belong together and cause confusion. Maybe they get people thinking, does that go together? How can that be? He usually spends several weeks working on a picture. One of the most important issues is deciding where he can best put his ideas into practice. Places in northern Germany are among his favorite locations. On a small section of North Sea coast, Thomas Vreda makes a drive-in cinema on a deserted island. He photographed this mountainside rest area in a former open cast mine. When the 47-year-old has found the right backdrop, he gets down to work. The picture has to be taken from a particular perspective so that a few patches of leftover snow look like a polar ice scape. Sometimes it takes hours until Vreda is satisfied with the light quality. On the one hand, it's an expression of my yearning for a lovely romantic landscape, which I can create with limited means. And at the same time, I like creating visual traps out of something small like a puddle or a heap of snow. I can create a landscape that you can't really locate. Thomas Vreda uses a traditional large format camera for his pictures. His large-scale 2 meter by 2 meter 50 prints can only be produced with a special camera. This allows him to achieve the necessary quality. To create the depth of field, he needs to use a special lens. Normally, with close-ups, you can only focus on a really small area. The human eye can only concentrate on a small area. But with the lens, I can achieve a great depth of field, and that creates the illusion. He creates the images in his mind's eye recording his ideas in a sketchbook. Then he looks for the right models for his pictures. He already has hundreds of models in his studio in Münster, in northwest Germany.
The surprising thing is always that small structures look quite similar to big ones. Leonardo da Vinci once said, if you want to understand a mountain, you should examine a stone. On his large-scale prints, the houses often appear much bigger than they are in real life. That's why he likes people to see his photos in exhibitions. It's the ideal place for playing this game with illusion and reality. And that is all we have time for today on Euromax. If you happen to miss any of those reports or would like to see them again, just go to our website, dw-world.de slash English slash Euromax dash highlights. Thanks for joining us today and see you again soon. Bye-bye.